Vinod, thank you, and good morning to everybody. Um, so I'd like to just say that I believe that in today's world, the most powerful force of creating financial capital is cultural capital. And like, it's clear to me, um, it's not lost on me that I'm sitting here with a bunch of people from Silicon Valley. And yesterday I sat in the audience and heard Vinod say very clearly, I tell all my portfolio companies, do not hire advertising agencies. Um, <laughs> I mean, I heard that. I was sitting right there, actually. And I was like, shit, I'm speaking tomorrow morning. Why the fuck is he doing this to me? <laughs> but I understood where he was coming from. I really did. Because if you ask me what the most important force in creating financial capital is, I expect very few in this room to say cultural capital. And you're probably looking at me, furrowing your eyebrows, going, really, Steve? But you know what? This is exactly what I'd like to address uh, uh, this morning. Very simple belief that cultural capital has grown from the beginning of my career. I started in the music business in uh, 1992 as a, as a road manager. Um, it's what you do when you drop out of five colleges and you just try to look busy so your parents won't get pissed off at you. You uh, say that you're working with a famous act and you go on the road and call from different cities and either they think you're selling drugs or doing something important. Um, <laughs> But what I would like to do is share a, a snapshot with you of some key moments throughout history that started in the beginning of my career and show you how cultural capital has manifested from then till now. And I'm gonna start with uh, 1986. Like, I don't know what this photo means to a lot of you guys in this room, but I'll tell you what this photo means in culture. So Run DMC, famous rap group, uh, in 1986 had a song called My Adidas. And this song spoke very proudly about where their sneakers had taken them, the journey that they've been on with their sneakers. Um, the song became a top 10 hit. But more importantly, Adidas, the brand was at 2% market share in America. They were at the bottom of all the major footwear companies. And of that 2% market share in America, 80% of those sales was coming from the Northeast region. There was an executive there, Italian executive named Angelo Anastasio, who came over to America to sort of interrogate why this was coming from, this 2% market share was where it was, and why was it coming from the Northeast? What was the pulse there? And the first thing he realized is, not only these guys weren't buying these shoes, this one particular skew, the shell top Adidas, but they seem to be throwing the shoelaces away. Why do the shoes have no shoelaces? Why are they discarding the shoelaces? And I'm going to get to this later. But this was an important insight back in July 1986 that led to him going to a concert and watching uh, Run, M Run DMC perform the song My Adidas at Madison Square Garden. And this shot here is when Run performed the song, he took off his shoe and 18,000 kids took off their shoe and held their Adidas in the air. Tying executive finds and he sees this, and this leads to a very important insight. When you guys look at this photo, you probably see Tommy Lee, Men in Black, Will Smith, getting jiggy with it. However, um, I was a uh, record executive at that time. I worked at Sony in 1997, and I signed Will Smith and the Men in Black soundtrack. And Will Smith had actually gotten dropped from his prior record company. They discarded him because culture was moving in this way of Wu-Tang and Biggie Smalls and these such more hardcore rap. And the kind of rap that Will Smith was doing had sort of been discarded and treated as something of the past. And they let him go. I had known Will Smith for many years, and I, I signed him. And I signed him on the strength of Men in Black. Well, we sold 10 million copies of Men in Black. And that was back when you were buying CDs for $16.99. So we did really well. But what was astounding to me and which changed my career was not that we sold 10 million copies, was that those glasses sold 14 million. The glasses sold more than the album, and the glasses paid nothing to be a part of the campaign. Very important insight that we're going to cut to later. 
not to beat up the Will Smith topic, but this is Will Smith, and this is uh, from the movies Bad Boys, 1995. You guys familiar with the movie Bad Boys, anybody? This room, all right, cool. So Bad Boys came out in 1995, and in the movie business, they used trailing data that the movie studios use, because they're geniuses, right? And they used some conventional wisdom that said that black actors can't open up movies globally. So literally, Sony did not send Will Smith and Martin Lawrence on the road internationally to open up this movie. There was a blockbuster in the US, but they said, why would we send these guys overseas? Nobody's gonna pay 10 euros or eight euros or whatever it was at the time to see an African American open up a movie. That makes no sense. And we have the data to prove it. So no tools to measure cultural impact, and they had no idea uh, what they were missing. This is, this is 1995, okay? Now, as meaningful as these historical moments was, and were happening in the business, it is actually telling on how advanced and how much has changed the compounded effect of cultural impact from those moments I spoke about, uh, 86, 95, and 97, to today. These were watershed moments that were misunderstood. And at the time, they pale in comparison to the truisms that apply today. So let's go back to sneakers. February 2015, Adidas does a deal with Kanye West. Now, outside of all of our personal opinions of Kanye West, <laughs> that's not the point here. The point here is, since February uh, 2015, when he first released his shoe, Adidas stock up 250%. Nike flat. These are facts. This is cultural capital giving financial return. He's clearly accretive to their business. Now, this is not about how many sneakers he sold. Because it's very easy to say, oh, so Kanye put out a big sneaker, the sneaker sold a bunch of shoes. No, they were releasing 3,000 at a time. These were not changing the bottom line, the actual sale of the shoes. The halo effect that he had on the brand changed perception that led to this outsized, you guys can take it down, outcome. Again, how cultural capital affects public company. Now, Beats, the most valuable and most largest, most valuable company in the world buys Beats for $3 billion. I don't know what everyone in this room thought at the time of that transaction. I'm sure somebody goes, why would Apple pay for headphones? Like, why would they buy a headphone company? Headphones aren't even that good. Who cares? They break, whatever. They didn't buy a headphone company. They're not lucky, Apple. I mean, smart company led by great executives. They knew they, were buying, they had to buy into culture. They had to buy into tomorrow. They could not compete in the streaming music business without having a foothold in culture. Who moves culture? What moves culture? Who are the, the people that drive contagion? They needed to be in business with those folks. So, Although the headphones were profitable, did about $250 million in EBITDA a year, they didn't buy headphones. They were actually buying a culture to launch their streaming business. These are facts. And then you look at bad boys not going on the road, and today, Black Panther passing the Titanic to become the third biggest movie in US history. Uh, so yesterday's ethnic insight is today's total market dominance. And I just, while we on this topic, uh, I want you guys to give it up for the writer and director of Black Panther, Mr. Ryan Coogler, is in the back right here, raising his hand. And of course, his beautiful wife is right there holding it down as she does. I could go off, listen, I could go off on a rant similar to what uh, Ashton did yesterday and start flipping out there's not enough black people in this room, but we could do that later. I can get Ryan. <laughs> so 
what historically were moments within the pockets of culture, what were pockets and uh, moments in pockets of culture is now transforming businesses, but why? So what you see in these three recent moments that I just shared is like, why is it important for cultural capital has accelerated so much my career? What was the trigger that made cultural capital compound this way? And we're gonna get through this. There's three reasons. The decline of demography, the misunderstood attention economy, and essentially the speed of fame. And these are the three reasons that I wanna highlight. So let's talk about the decline of demography. These, this is a census form. And what this form is supposed to do at some point, outside of counting Americans, it's supposed to give you some insight on who you are, like what person's race, white, black, African-American or Negro, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian Indian, Chinese, Filipino, Japanese. None of these things have nothing to do with sort of giving an insight to who you are. But these are exactly the same boxes that media segmentation is based off of. You see, these boxes are meant to divide people into neat packages. If you fit in this box, you fit into this box. Boxes are easy, but in truth, these boxes are absolutely misleading. In the music industry, we were among the first to begin to see the decline of demography. And like what we would see is, we're releasing an album, it has no radio play in Kansas City or no radio play in uh, Idaho, but all of a sudden what we see is the sales skyrocketing. And the reason why there was no, no, uh, no radio play in that market is because the local radio programmers thought, why would these kids listen to this music? They don't want to hear that. Meanwhile, they love that. But the boxes actually said, this is not for them, we're gonna program them more Michael Bolton. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to do that to Michael Bolton. But I did, because they were actually programming wrong, because they were programming based off of segmentation. Like in the 60s, AM radio played the hits. You'd go from, you'd go from uh, uh, Curtis Mayfield right to Bob Dylan, right to, like they didn't care, they played the hits. And then like FM, the advent of FM radio was obviously FM, you guys know, is a technology that would split signals. And when they could split the signals, they used that to then create these stations that basically played songs based off of demographics. So it was an R&B station, or this station, or this station, or this station, and they basically put segmented people, but this was a way for advertisers to actually sell different audiences, this was not necessarily true about the audience taste. And that's exactly what we found out in the music business, how that the, the way the market was segmenting uh, individuals had nothing to do with the truth about individuals' taste. And we knew, and I knew specifically, there was no turning back. And then we got, you know, the truth about music. And, you know, uh, Tim Westergreen, are you here? Tim, there he goes in the back. Tim knows about this all from his days at Pandora. But literally, you can take someone's listening habits of music and actually determine who they're gonna vote for, what gene are they gonna buy. And in fact, your music listening habits tells you more than your race, your household income, or your zip code. And that is the thesis that I'm building my new company, United Masters, on. The fact is music succeeds where politics, religion, and clearly, demography fails. Which brings me to my next point. The misunderstood attention economy. You know, so much of the excitement about the advancements in tech is about the ability to market 101. Programmatic, targeting, and hyper-individualizing. Everyone has a custom unique experience, just as I alluded to, and Increasingly, that same customization and uniqueness actually over time becomes isolating. As evidence, when you look at all these photos, these are people standing in line all around different experiences. We are social creatures. So got, kids are buying, standing in line for Bieber merch or Yeezys and the like or Supreme. 
What's misunderstood about the attention economy is because we're social creatures, how thinly sliced individual media experiences, it's increasingly rare and downright exciting to feel connected to others. So hyper-individualizing does nothing to connect you to something bigger than yourself. It just focuses on you as an individual. So that's why you have to blend me plus we. Personalization plus we communal experiences. The brands that master both are cultural leaders and invariably more successful. Connecting people is a critical counterweight to segmenting people. It's very important as you start looking at the one-to-one, -one, as you start looking at data and you start, we talked about, uh, I think it was Stephen Blank who spoke yesterday and talked about the power of data and how you have to read it and you have to read it on the edges, right? It's very similar conceptually. Hi, reading hyper-individualization data doesn't inform you on the factor of how you use communal data to help drive influence. And the third and final reason is the acceleration of fame. Gone are the days where you can treat all audiences the same. The speed of fame moves too fast to predict who will have the power and the crowd behind them. So I'm going to use a quick example here and move on. This is a girl named Cardi B. I don't know how many of you guys have heard of Cardi B, uh, but if you have a kid, you definitely heard of Cardi B. Cardi B, um, this is uh, 2017. Like right back here, like October of 2016, um, Cardi B was an exotic dancer. She wasn't a rapper. She was an ex stripper. Or an ex I'm sorry, an exotic dancer. <laughs> and... <laughs> The former adult dancer gets, signs a deal in February because she builds a large following on Instagram. She releases the song in June. September, the song reaches number one and passes pop star Taylor Swift. That happened, stripper, October 16, number one artist, September 17. No formal music experience. The speed of fame. These are real things. And this is not an anomaly. I'm just using this because it's a famous example. This is not an anomaly. This is happening nonstop. And you start talking about how am I going to be locked up with culture? How am I going to understand what's coming next? How am I going to pivot my business to really get to a marketplace and a market? If you are in a consumer business, you need to understand all of these uh, different drivers that change and, 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 and sort of create consumer opinion and get this understanding, the underpinnings of what drives us on your side, inside your company. You know, it's not just the cultural velocity uh, that materializes fame fast. It's the influence these individuals have that, that are wide and deep. And not only the individual, but also the people that they influence. You know, you don't want to be the CEO who wakes up like even Evan did and, and see 1.7 billion knocked off your market cap because somebody said something about your service. And this is how, this is again, not an anomaly. These are real things. That somebody who had an influence on a social platform decided to say because of something that was real and people felt it and because they could voice that opinion because of social media, their fame and influence caused this seismic effect to the market uh, price of market cap price of value of Snapchat. So we've seen the power of cultural capital and I wanna just not give you some mysterious uh, information or something ambiguous, but real tools that I believe you can start to apply today on how you can harness these sort of learnings and principles uh, for your business. So, this is very personal to me, the multilingual, multi, multilingual mandate. So most companies think about expertise in technology, technology culture, and storytelling. They think about separate, separate dipl uh, disciplines inside the org chart. The way I feel about it is today that culture, storytelling, and technology it's the convergence of those three things. In fact, if every employee inside your company 
is not prolific at least at two of the three things, I think you're right for disruption. That's what big companies, that's what the incumbents don't have. They isolated these features. They thought if you're a tech guy, you're the nerd guy over here in the corner and the, the culture guys are the cool guys way over here and like the storytellers, we use them when we need to amplify something, no. It's like when you see LeBron play, he's big and fast and can shoot. Like that's what you gotta have inside your company. Guys that understand culture, understand storytelling, understand technology, and have empathy. Because even the discipline you don't know, you have, to be, you have to understand within the organization that it's not a discipline that I'm well versed at, but you are, so let's still work together. Whereas companies of the past would separate these and put them in isolation. You, you've seen it before where the R&D guys and the marketing guys hate each other. They don't even talk to one another. Those days are gone. Those days have to be eradicated for you not to be one of these incumbents that get disrupted. This is where the world is going. And these next, um, this next uh, sort of college graduates coming out right now in the workforce, they're all about this. They can speak these languages. They're trained to understand these languages. Understanding influence, not just fame. It's very important. I got a short film here I want to share with you guys on a case that we utilize this principle on for an HBO um, a documentary. These days, it's understandable to think that the person with the most influence is whoever has the most followers. But as easy as it is to conflate the two, marketers today must know that sheer reach and the ability to influence the purchases, preferences, and priorities of others are two totally different things. So we've been with a star-studded cast, their docu-series, The Defiant Ones, with a combined audience in the hundreds of millions. HBO was still keen for an influencer approach that would ensure viewership, not just awareness. They achieved this by setting fame aside to emphasize and ignite true influence. By engaging a social cast, lesser known people who were unrelated to the story, but still embodied the defiance the series celebrated, HBO was able to create a vast network of credible advocates who could lift the cultural conversation around defiance well beyond the fan base of the show's stars. HBO collected dozens of their stories of overcoming doubt and began publishing them just before the series premiere. This broke the significance of the show out of the gilded cage of the music industry where it was set and directly into the lives of the people they hoped would tune in. Now, Defiance wasn't just about the titans many knew of but few knew. It was about chefs, professors, and single dads. People in your real life whose social proximity made them far more influential over what you watched than any rock star. These stories ignited broad social participation, licensing everyday people to share related stories. With every new story published, HBO increased the likelihood that their potential audience would find a personal connection to the series and the resulting social pressure delivered the youngest and most diverse audience in network history. Right, so right here we break down, this is work we did that separates and you understand the difference between fame and influence. These are, in fact, two very different things, which in turn drives a different approach towards marketing. The net result of this was the most watched documentary in HBO history, right? So finding the defiant aspect in all the influences, not just using the famous people that were in the film, we didn't even use them. We actually used people and connected influences to the story of being, everyone in this room is defiant. If you're an entrepreneur, that's exactly what you are. You, you're defiant. So having your story be the story, not the famous guy's story, was what we focused on and that led to this result. So I know what Vinod thinks, but I'm just telling you, this actually really works. This is not like fake stuff. Um, <laughs> so, I, so in aggregate, the cultural capital becomes more, much more of a powerful tool than fame alone. ID number three, start, finish, start sentences, don't finish them, right? That's me versus we. Allow the consumer, allow the customer, allow the cohort that you're marketing your product to, allow them to partake in the conversation, and that you start the conversation, you start the sentence, and you allow them to finish them. I'm gonna show you an example of that as a marketing tactic I'm also gonna use 
a uh, film idea. It's a film straight out of somewhere, which is a movie straight out of Compton. And this is a tactic that we utilize in order to get people engaged because I'm straight out of Com Dr. Dre and NWA and all those guys, they're straight out of Compton. But everybody in this room is straight out of somewhere, right? Like straight out of India, straight out of Silicon Valley, straight out of Queens, straight out of whatever. And how do you, again, start the conversation and allow the customer to finish it. You've probably heard of Straight Out of Compton, even if you're not a fan of gangster rap. That's because in the summer of 2015, Beats by Dre delivered an inescapable social campaign in support of a small budget film by the same name. By creating a simple tool to allow people to make memes by typing in their city name and uploading an image. The campaign was successful and inspired contributions from some of the world's most famous names who uniformly celebrated their hometowns and stuck with the campaign concept. We're all straight out of somewhere. But what you may not know is why. After days of scene setting by Beats, the campaign finally roared to life when a few users hacked the generator to tell a different story, forever changing the intent of Straight Outta from I'm directly from to I've exhausted my supply. This simple change opened the storytelling capability for the audience and empowered them not just to claim their hometown, but demonstrate their wit, their brand of social commentary, and even the soundness of their political position. White House tweeted, Iran would be, quote, straight out of uranium. Conversation volume jumped 460% overnight, and then 9,000 across the following 48 hours. Though most users were telling a different story than the brand, Beats had successfully created the cultural context for them to want to do so through the campaign. By starting a sentence, consumers were eager to finish. Right. So again, this is not storytelling per se, but story starting and allowing the brand, the customer, to partake. That's we. Right. Again, there goes the KPI that we could all show our CEOs or board members or whatever on why marketing actually, when done correctly, works. Film cost $28 million, made 200 and it's a movie that no one would think would make that kind of worldwide box office given uh, the nature of its content. However, it influenced people to get involved, which led to this result. And finally, I want to share something and speak about um, one of the brands that we work with that we put into culture. Um, and it's the idea of like create something to stand behind and not stand next to. Um, when the NBA approached us, it was right after the issue with the owner in, um, with the Clippers, who had made very negative comments about African Americans and just immigrants in general. And Adam Silva and his team had a problem. The NBA had became a league that was entertaining but lacked a broader and deeper sense of purpose, similar to what the NFL is in uh, right now. Um, they weren't in that situation, but it, it was heading there uh, given what was taking place. And that was the concern. Um, and it was a league of amazing shots and these amazing athletes, but what was the bigger purpose? How could we grow this sport? How, do, how could we stand behind something and use this rallying moment to do something about it? And like, that's what made us come up with, the, um, with an insight here that we're gonna use this moment to actually supercharge and change the narrative of what the league was to where the league is going. And I'm gonna play this film. It, It was something um, that I just want to say personally, I was very proud to work on and very proud to do um, because you know, we got uh, uh, Martin Luther King's words in this film about the play. They wouldn't do that. The estate wouldn't license this to anything. It, it, it took time to explain to them the purpose, some of the, uh, what I was talking about, standing behind something and the reason why, and it sort of getting their support led to this. I have a dream. That one day, yeah. this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. Because I have a dream yeah. that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. to speed up that day when all of God's 
God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands free at last. Um, so I'll leave with you these four ideas that I hope you'll be able to incorporate into how you, each one of you taps into the unmatched power of cultural capital and incorporate it as an ingredient as you lead your business. When I look at what Mario's doing with Oscar and Animal with Ginger I.O., I think that mental health is extremely uh, a topic that culture can play a deep role in removing the, the stigma around uh, issues with mental health. Uh, Pat Brown, what you're doing with Impossible Foods, um, you mean you guys are you you guys are changing the perception of of what meat is. Um, of course, culture plays a role in that. I mean, you, you your your test product is a burger. I mean, <laughs> like for the right reasons, right? Because of its relationship and value with culture. And uh, Adrian at Forward, again, I mean, I believe that some of the insights that we share here, or that I shared with you today, can be a very important part of your business. Um, I've always been on a quest my entire career, ever since that Will Smith moment. How do I take cultural capital and build a business that understands the best way to monetize it? And um, United Masters, which is a company I built two years ago, um, is all about taking all of these data signals that detect culture and utilizing it to build marketing platforms for brands and for artists and individuals so that they can actually uh, maximize monetization on a one-to-one -one basis, understanding that culture is the lead principle here. Vinod, Samir, and everyone at uh, Coastal Ventures, uh, thank you for having me. Thanks. That was awesome. We'll take a short break. Uh, by the way, uh, just clarifying my comments on agencies. Uh, first, I will change my mind. Um, no, uh, I went through this exercise with a couple of you. I said, in deciding your brand values, you really should do it internal to the company. Translating it into message and adoption is where agencies and external resources are really, really valuable. Those are two very different things. What you believe in, and what you're trying to do is what should come from the team. Packaging of that into most effective messaging and storytelling should come from an agency. Thank you all, we'll be back.